So exciting. Gracious. That was very exciting. Hello, everyone. We made it on time, despite our tech issues. Just barely. How is everyone today? And, and who are you and where are you? Let us know you're here and where you're from. We'd love to say hello before we get started today. How are you after you that minor heart attack, Mary? <laughs> <laughs> So Nicole and I signed in and, and for some reason we couldn't hear me or she couldn't hear me because my, my, my audio wasn't working, but I think we have uh, hopefully resolved it. Um, I'm doing well. I have had a good week. I'm happy it's Friday. How's your mm -hmm. week been? It's been a good week. It's been a busy week and a, I don't know, has anyone else been feeling like jangly energy this week? Like a lot going on and I don't know. I'm, I'm looking forward to the weekend. Yeah, me too. Um, mm -hmm. I have definitely felt that way, but I, it's hard to not feel like that these days. I think a lot of weeks feel like that to me. <laughs> yeah, basically every week by Friday, we're feeling it. Um, great. Oh, now I'm seeing the chat. I wasn't before. Hi. Hi. Hello, Hi. Britt. And Amanda. Brenda's here. Robin's here. Hi, Shelly. Nice to see you. Um, so should we start talking about the book? I think we should start. Should we, should we do our introductions? Let's do, do that. Let's do, do that while I'm pulling up my document. Um, sure. Well, while you're doing that, I'll just mention that if anyone is joining us for the first time, Mary and I started craft talk book club because we're both um, writing coaches and we're both really passionate about craft and how we can improve our writing by learning through example through the books that we really love ourselves so we thought it would be great to meet with other writers who share this passion and want to learn by reading great books so that's yeah. why we're here yeah and we've been so far this year we've been alternating um fiction and nonfiction month to month. So this past month, April was nonfiction to hell with it by Gentile Moore. Um, and today, later today, we will announce the, um, the novel for May. Yay. So exciting. But we thought we'd start with a warm up question. Mm -hmm. uh, we'd like to start with just, you know, a fun icebreaker. And today's is what is something that you recommend? It doesn't have to be a book. It doesn't even have to be a TV show or a movie. It could be a vacation spot. It could be skincare. What is just something you love lately that you want to recommend? Let us know in the chat. Let's share some ideas. Do you have something, Nicole? Can I say big earrings? I don't know. I'm really loving your earrings, Mary. <laughs> I do love big earrings. And I did watch, um, we're watching, what is it called? This is a robbery on Netflix. I don't know. True crime. Know about uh, the largest art heist, at least in the U.S., at uh, one of the museums in Boston. So it's been really, okay. we watched the first one. It's pretty engaging. It's pretty interesting. Hi, Allison. Allison, I agree. This lipstick looks great. I've complimented it like four times today. <laughs> she has. Thanks so much for being here. I'm glad you're here, Allison. It's oh, really that's nice to hear people call us lovely in the chat, too. I have no objection to that whatsoever. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I, I haven't heard of that. And I love art heist stuff like the goldfinch. Did you ever read the goldfinch? No. Great. It's fiction, but it's, it, it involves art theft. Um, mm. okay. And then we're getting some good recommendations in the chat here. Um, we are getting... <laughs> what's that? There's oh. a recommendation to get your COVID shot and how liberating it is. <laughs> I'm, I've registered. I have to wait a little longer, but I'm hoping to get mine soon. Yeah, it will be exciting when you get it. It is, I, I have found it liberating. I haven't found it so liberating yet that I've done anything that seems really crazy, like get a massage or go to a yoga class, but I have mm. gone to the hair salon and I felt comfortable doing that. Mm. Um, Made You Look is another great art, art forgery documentary. Cool. Awesome. Um, mm, so, sorry, I, I don't want to dive in and interrupt. Mary. Go ahead. <laughs> I, think I was we going have to say Carolyn's stashed lemon ginger tea sounds really good. It really does. Um, 
Also, ha oh, Hagen does chocolate chocolate chip ice cream. That is great to know about. I have recently discovered Grater's ice cream, G R A E T E R S. I believe it's mm -hmm. based in Ohio. Mm -hmm. You can buy it at Kroger. It is outrageously expensive. <laughs> what a big tub of it is like fifteen dollars. It's really really expensive, and it's worth every penny. It is so delicious. Mm, good to know. Any other chocoholics out there? I think Mary and I are both chocoholics. So any chocolate recommendations? Oh, yes. Mm. Um, oh, Trini, Clista says Trini of London. Yes, that was recommended by me. Trini is uh, a great, she just has an amazing like makeup line. And she's also really fun mm. to follow on Instagram. Nice. So, Great. We got some good recommendations. Well, um, why don't we do some bios? Sounds and great. And if anyone is just joining us for the first time, so you know who we are, and mm -hmm. then we'll dive into our book here. Um, Sounds good. I'd love to introduce you, Mary. Please go ahead. Why don't we start with that? <laughs> All right. So I'm so pleased to introduce my dear friend and brilliant writer, Mary Adkins, who is the author of the novels When You Read This. Indie Next Pick and Best Book of 2019 by Good Housekeeping. And Privilege, New York Post Best Book of the Week and Today.com Best Summer Read. Her books have been published in 13 countries. And her next novel, Palm Beach, will be published by Harper Collins this summer. Her essays and reporting have appeared in The New York Times, The Atlantic, Slate, and more. She teaches storytelling for the moth worldwide and creative writing both online and in her hometown of Nashville. Yay, Mary. And I will introduce Nicole. Um, Nicole Bright is an award-winning essayist, poet, and writing instructor based on Canada's Sunshine Coast, which I love to say every time. Her work is widely published in print and online journals, and her essay, An Atmospheric Pressure, was selected as a notable by the editors of Best American Essays 2017. She's the creator of Spark Your Story, a series of online programs for life writers that helps writers get experimental with structure and master the foundations of storycraft. Great. Thanks, Mary. And... To kick us off our discussion of this exciting book that we read this month, um, I am just going to read a quote um, about the book. Um, the quote is, what would the world be like if eternal damnation was not hanging constantly over our sheepish heads in To Hell With It? More reflects on, on and pokes fun at the over-seriousness of religion in various texts, combining narratives of his everyday life, reflections on his childhood, and religion's influence on contemporary culture and society, um, and also drawings. Um, so we thought it was kind of fun last month when we just took a really basic poll. So we thought maybe we would just start with a poll. Just to see in the chat, kind of get the take the temperature of the room. What was your take on this book? Dislike, like, like a lot. Best book I ever read. We'll take a very oversimplified poll, <laughs> and then we'll discuss it. We'll then we'll get into all the nuances. But mm -hmm. sounds that, good. Reaction from people. Mm -hmm. Dislike, like, like a lot. Best book I ever read. Well, I How spoil did you things by saying like a lot. <laughs> oh, Clista's in it with me. Like a lot. Dislike, hated it, couldn't finish. Oh, Robin. <laughs> Shelly loved the humor. Mm. I'm curious, oh. not being able to finish it, what was that? Where did that come from, Robin? Where did that come from for, for you? What did you... What did you dislike so much about it? Shelly liked it a lot. Cool. Mm -hmm. um, so Nicole, you liked it a lot. I did like it a lot. I think this is a really ambitious book that took some chances. And so I really admired it, first of all, that, you know, it's it's tough to, to take a go at humor writing, I think. Uh, it's yeah. not something that I've done a lot of myself. I've been kind of shying away from it. Um, and then, of course, the subject matter to take on Dante and centuries of uh, of his um, influence um, in our Western culture and um, and also taking chances with form. I thought being um, 
putting out a, a literary book that really um, tries to do interesting things with the text uh, and image. I thought I thought in a few ways he took some chances. So I really loved that about the book, and I did find it funny. <laughs> yeah, I yeah I think that's such a good way of putting it. Like, what a bold. Um, just to experiment so much with structure with, I love, yeah, that, I wasn't even thinking of it that way. Like taking on Dante is quite a, um, you know, quite a, just quite a, a I was going to say audacious move. Um, mm -hmm. And I, so good for him. I like when people do audacious things, especially <laughs> writers. <laughs> well, and then, you know, we fought, we can follow in their footsteps when someone blazes a trail or tries something new. It's like, oh, it's like giving us permission to try those things as artists yeah. ourselves. And yeah. I do feel inspired to write some, some humor. And I'm going to share some ideas at the end of our, closer to the end of our book talk about how we might try a few things um, inspired by this book. So. Awesome. Yeah. Um, Amanda says, I admired it for the reasons Nicole said it was ambitious and I appreciated it. Yeah. Um, I also found it funny. I, f I found him very funny. I think I mentioned to Nicole yesterday, he, rem he reminded me of David Sedaris a mm -hmm. lot mm -hmm. in his observations of, of people and kind of um, noting the absurdity in, in everyday life. I thought he, he does that really well. Like I found myself laughing out loud a lot. Mm -hmm. I think this is maybe a good segue to talk about what's working with the humor for those of us who found it funny and are, are interested in, you know, digging down a little deeper into how craft wise we can write into the, the, or find the humor in things. Um, so I wondered if we could, we could talk about whether, how he achieved his aim. Of, of writing a funny book about a serious topic. And that was something that we talked about um, the other day, Mary. And I wondered if you wanted to, to jump in with some of the juxtapositions that we were talking about that work well in the book. Yeah, you know, I think humor can be um, uh, a fun thing to try to unpack mechanically. Like, why are things funny? And, you know, I don't, I mean, I'm not a, a comedian or a professional comic, but I do, I have thought a lot about it. My first novel, I really, I, I tried to write a lot of humor into it and I didn't do that by studying how to be funny, more just writing intuitively, like what I thought was funny. Mm -hmm. It was more in retrospect that I, I recognized um, some devices that we can use if we're trying to write humor that I think Dinty uses effectively in this book. And one that he does a lot of is um, he's, he just uses juxtapositions in a way that are surprising and therefore funny. So mm -hmm. for example, like um, I'm looking on page 14. So this is my, this is what my copy looks like. If your copy mm -hmm. looks like page 14. Um, so I'm just gonna read a small excerpt as an example of what I'm talking about kind of uh, the, the, the striking juxtapositions that he uses. A pagan baby, as they were called, cost $5 to rescue in the mid-1960s. And each year there was a contest to see which classroom in our school could save the most little pagans. For every $5 in sacrifice to milk money we came up with as a class, we earned a certificate that was pinned to the bulletin board in front of the room. And also these additional benefits. One, the knowledge that we had liberated a blameless little one from a diminished eternity. And two, we got to give the kid a name. <laughs> so I think that one and two for me really captures his ability to, or what he would do is juxtapose like an elevated or abstract or like principled statement with something really, really down to earth, really, you know, the opposite of something irreverent, even just something childish, something juvenile. Um, liberating a blameless little one from diminished eternity, very elevated. We got to give the kid a name, even the language, the, me yeah. the, the meaning of what he's saying, all of it is just, you know, on the ground. And that he does that a lot. And I, I think successfully, like that, that kind of thing where, where you're like, you know, bringing us up here and then bringing us down quickly, I think can be, can be a great source of humor. Um, mm -hmm. Did you notice that kind of thing, Nicole? 
Yeah, I love that. And it and it brings me to how well he um, embodies little Dinty versus the nuns. Like there's that kind of juxtaposition and power differential at work too. Like he's really good at remembering what childhood is like and the questions that you have as a little kid, uh, you know, the young skeptic that he was. And I love those scenes where, like that one where, you know, what else would a kid really care about? I get to name a pagan baby. <laughs> <laughs> right. And he, you know, I think skeptical children tend to be like by definition precocious children, you know, mm -hmm. and precocious mm -hmm. children are funny. They like, it's funny that children can be so smart and skeptical. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's also, I think we see his skill in, in what he chooses to share. Like he chooses the, the chicken eating contest and, mm -hmm. um, the, you know, the man who's damp from head to toe, like he chooses things that are funny. And that's what I mean by David Sedaris, like too, like, I think he has a good eye for, for quirky things that people will enjoy reading about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some so of those seem feel like they almost write themselves because the characters are just so kind of interesting and, and odd and and this is humanity. Like, this is us. <laughs> <laughs> this is us. <laughs> um, Amanda says, what... oh, go ahead. Is that what you were looking at? Uh, no, I was just going to say that um, Marion makes a really good observation here that the way that he's writing, um, combining the adult who's writing with the child's perspective without saying, now I understand, but then that's exactly right. He puts us right into that, that mm -hmm. moment of being the child. And mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. And I was just looking at Amanda's point too. I love that Amanda on page 28, like the way that he uses spacing um, as a, like as a, a substitute for basically time. Yeah. Timing that mm -hmm. like a comment, actual comic would use on the stage. Um, like on page 28, thinking about sex all the time. So just stop thinking about it. Break. How did that work out? Yeah. Right. right. Like, like yeah. giving us spaces as pauses. He does that with line breaks a lot mm -hmm. too. You know, the line break gives you a shorter pause, but it's still a short pause. Um, While we're in that section um, that Amanda's pointed us to, I had a question <laughs> about it because I've noticed that he uses symbols and sometimes it's a pickle, you know, when relevant to separate text. Mm -hmm. And I know this one um, references the forbidden fruit. And I kept looking at these two asterisks and and um, I don't know what those symbols are called, the little wavy dashes. And I was like, what is that? Like, what is, what is it? Does anyone, can anyone tell what that is or what that might be? That's it's really like, interesting. Is it, is it fruit? Is it like two apples? Is it like two eyes? I don't know. I mean, it's the chapter's called the burning bush. Does he use that same symbol throughout or just in that chapter? Just through that section. Huh. Oh, right. Because in other sections, he has like, there's a cross in one of them. Mm -hmm. A lot of times he just uses white space. Um, Robin, what is tilled? Robin says tilled. Oh, right. that's what the name of the, the symbol is. The tilled. Is oh, it tilled? Oh, tilled? Gotcha. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think we might have to ask Dinty this question. Because <laughs> it feels meaningful. The symbol is meaningful somehow. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. he could have literally, I mean, he could have used anything. And I've never seen that symbol before. He could have used just mm -hmm. an aspect. Yeah, he, there's definitely a joke there. I think it's, I think there's a joke there for us. Yeah. Oh, you're right. Now I see the pickles. I had, for some reason, I hadn't noticed the pickles on my first read. <laughs> yeah, that's another funny yeah. thing that I noticed that he did, which was um, like, but in taking on Dante, he's like using the cantos as his structure. And then he's rewriting the first canto in the, the poem. Mm -hmm. And he's often, you know, using something um, from the cantos to frame, to frame what follows. Like um, mm -hmm. in the pickling swill comes from the quote to see that spirit pickled in this swill. So he, he's sort of being like poking like a little bit. And I just think it's, it's funny the way that he, you know, forms a counter argument and really adopts 
um, the original text in interesting yeah. ways to, to frame his argument. And you know, I know that that's also a technique um, that you can, you, if you start to notice like explicitly humor writing will often start with something that is that is sort of standard and expected and well-known and not funny, you know, like e even if it's not taking a, taking that form, even if it's just, um, so for example, let's say you were writing humor using the form of um, a job letter. Like you're, you're writing a cover letter to try to get a job. Mm -hmm. The first line of it might be completely normal. Like it reads like an actual job letter, like dear sir or madame, I'm writing to express my interest in the position of human resources officer or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then only then does it gradually start to unravel into like surprising mm -hmm. things and then maybe absurd things, but it starts out mm -hmm. being totally textbook. Mm -hmm. And I, that's kind of what he's doing here too, right? Like he's mm -hmm. like giving us our starting place, which is not humorous. And it just orients us to what, where in the world we are that we're going to poke fun at. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Maybe it is a burning bush, Marion. I wondered if it could be something like that too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I bet it is. I think that's a great guess because <laughs> it kind mm -hmm. of looks like it's called That's the burning good. bush that that section. So Mary, I wanted to ask you to share um, one of the things that we talked about, which I thought was just so brilliant that you'd noticed this turn about two thirds into the book. And that's another juxtaposition, the sort of light and darkness in this book. So I wondered if we could talk about that a little bit. And yeah, how it works with humor yeah. writing. Yeah, I um so I, Nicole and I were chatting about the book yesterday and, you know, it's kind of funny. Like we have all the, and we talked about the parts we found really funny. Um, you know, I loved all the, all the images and apparently he drew a lot of these images um, or assembled them. And, you know, the, I think there's a lot of it. That's just, that's just, you know, it's, it's critical and it's a logical argument, but it's also just poking fun. Like the, I mean, I think this is my favorite one. Where is it? This image of the, um, the box, <laughs> the box that says, see why Jesus died. And you look inside and it's a, like a warp, warped mirror. <laughs> like that's very, that was very funny to me. Mm -hmm. um, like they're all funny images and he really is keeping it quite light. And then it's like page, you know, this page is not actually numbered, but like page 96, um, right before the chapter called the hell hole, we suddenly have actual images of his family, right? And these are family members of his and he retains some of this like kind of comic, it's hard because of the camera's opposite, which way am I moving it? Um, Cause some of the like, you know, comic style aesthetic of like dead at 35, you know, dead at 33, not with the handwriting, not only aesthetic, but in tone, like using saying dead, you know, is like, again, that kind of like really um, irreverent. It's like an irreverent tone. But that I think signals, in my experience of reading, it signaled a, a pretty major transition from like, you know, being purely like keeping everything at arm's distance and being critical and funny to, to being vulnerable and sincere and talking about the experience of his own family members. And, um, and then I think we get on page 106, I highlighted the last couple of paragraphs on page 106, because that's where I really felt like, Oh, this is where he's telling us why he's writing this book. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'll just read that part. He says, which begs the question, the one I keep asking here in different ways, were my parents and these other people I never knew, my phantom grandparents and great grandparents, woefully unhappy because they were sinners or were they depressed? And in some cases to the point of suicide because their natural human weakness had been defined as horrible and sinful because they feared that when dead, the crushing agony of hell might be their fate forever and ever. 
is that any way to live? And I, for me, I felt like when I got to those two paragraphs, it gave his project uh, a more personal meaning. Like I understood why he was interested in this investigation. It, it's not, it's not, or it wasn't just an intellectual exercise for him. It was something he, he thinks about because he cares about these people and, you know, wanted and is trying to think about like what certain, certain ideologies that touch their lives, whether they embrace them or not, how, how those ideologies may have actually like been toxic for them or destructive for them. Mm -hmm. Um, and he cares about that. And I think from then on, you know, there's some, there are definitely some funny ish parts after that. But if, for me, that was a big turning point. Like the rest of the, the rest of the book is very personal. It like, you know, we get into that, um, the story of the, the malarkeys, right? The boy and his dad and that sad, very sad story, which had a really interesting structure. The way he told that story was kind of, was cool. Um, and then, and then the story of that bombing, you know? And so I just, I, and then, and then even that beautiful moment at the end that he has that for him is a kind of like really earthly redemption. I think in Italy, it's all, it's all sincere after that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I found that effective. I'm curious if others did. I mean, I think I was telling Nicole, I don't know if anyone has seen the, the um, movie Bamboozled, Spike Lee's movie Bamboozled. It came out in like 2003 or something. It's been a long time. But I, I think of that movie um, often. And because the experience of that movie for me was laughing, 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 and then all of a sudden not laughing, like realizing that my laughter had this meaning and... Um, and a problematic meaning that I wasn't even aware of as I was laughing. It's it's a movie about racism and the way that we racism factors into storytelling or cultural storytelling over the decades. And mm -hmm. at least that's why I haven't seen it in a long time, but that's how I would have described it when I saw it. And reading this book was a little bit like that for me too. It was like laughing, kind of following along. And then all of a sudden it was like, here's, okay, here's the truth. Like I'm going to open the doors mm -hmm. now to what, what is really going on and why I've brought you here. Mm -hmm. I was kind of blown away by the, by the depth of the, the intimacy, how close he brings us into why this story really matters to him. And it mm. really endeared me to the story. Like I had, um, I appreciated the story. I wanted to follow the intellectual argument. I also shared that skepticism as a child. I grew up in a Catholic family too. And I had a lot of the same questions. So I was in it um, for those reasons. But then it just had so much heart and I just felt so much compassion for his family. And also um, I really liked, and I want to talk about this a little bit more, how we get that personal heart and it sort of radiates out this, this um, concern for him in his own life. He's, he tells us that he suffers from depression and he wonders what the link is. It's affected his family members, the influence of this belief system you know, radiates outwards into our larger sphere, our, our society and our culture in ways that also are harmful. And then we get this really dramatic, you know, scene where he witnesses evil in the um, in that bombing. And so th there's this sort of ring like I, I sort of pictured it as the ring. And mm -hmm. then I, I thought, oh, that would be an interesting, you know, assignment or not or exercise for us to do if we wanted to write our own argument. But I also when I when I was drawing rings and thinking about how I would write my own argument, I was like, oh, we're in the circles of hell now. <laughs> you know, all of these circles of, you know, influence and that has made his life and the lives of others that he cares about and everybody um, less pleasant and enjoyable than it really should be. So. I just wanted to share that. that. Yeah. Like, yeah, those rings. That's really cool. That's a cool way of reading it. Mm -hmm. And I just saw Amanda's note too. Um, you know, it mm -hmm. was saying, it would have, um, yeah, she wishes he had gone even further into mm -hmm. his own depression. Because you're right. He really just touched on it. He didn't go too deeply into it. Um, yeah, the hell we carry inside us. And then I think he also used the phrase like the hell that we 
something of our own making. Like it was mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. hell is, I mean, he says that a few times cause he quotes, he has that the Buddhist passage about hell being and the samurai remember like heaven and hell are both created by, we create both. Um, mm -hmm. A playwright friend talks about farce being humor, overlying desire and virulent anger. And I wonder if that's related to this turn. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did he seem angry to people? Or something else? I was thinking about this question and um, was thinking about how he points out Dante's anger and that one section about a lot. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. So he was standing back from himself and observing someone else's anger there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He has that. I actually read it out loud to my husband because I found it so funny. It was, um, I don't know if I can find it, but that pa the passage about that, that really made me laugh where he says like, um, you know, imagine, imagine spending however many years and writing 14,000 lines mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Back at a few people who made you mad in your twenties. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's angry. Yeah. <laughs> Past anger. Calista says, Amanda says, angry. angry at religion. The ass trumpet chapter seemed angry. Mm. Yeah, it's really interesting. I guess I do sense, I do sense some anger. Um, but I, yeah, I guess I do sense some anger. Maybe I was, I think the word that came to mind for me was ex more exasperation um, and sadness. I definitely feel sadness. Mm-hmm. When you when you said the word exasperated, it and then I I went back to the title and to hell with it sounds like exasperation, like you've mm -hmm. just reached that point where you're like not anymore. I can't do this anymore. To hell with yeah. it. To hell with it is like you're at the end. You're at the mm -hmm. end of feelings. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. I'm done. I'm accepting it. I'm moving on. So I wonder if we should, if we could talk about favorite passages. Does anyone want to share um, a passage that they really enjoyed? I'll start while we're waiting for people to type. Sure, sure. <laughs> um, so my, I, I loved Walter. Walter was the man <laughs> sitting on the stump who was dressed in winter garb in summer. And he said, what keeps, <laughs> what keeps you warm in the winter will keep you cool in the summer. And then Dinty isn't sure if what he's just said is pithy and profound or pithy and absolutely nonsensical. <laughs> um, and he says like, I'm, I'm damp from head to toe. It's working, it's sweating. And um yeah, and then he comes back, you know, he does come back to that later at the end and say like the the funny and the incredulous is what gets him through. And I I I loved that pat that early passage about Walter. I mm -hmm. I sensed it. It felt like a metaphor of the whole book to me before I even knew he was going to come back to it later. And I think it's because um maybe I sent maybe it was in the writing. You know, maybe it was in the how much I could tell this guy how much pleasure I think he gave Denti and how much Denti values that. Like, I, I think it, maybe I could feel that in the writing mm -hmm. or maybe I just relate to it. Cause I mm -hmm. also find humor to be a huge source of what makes life livable, <laughs> enjoyable. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I really loved, I loved that little passage. I like the way Denti described like his brain, like tripping over that idea. You know, like how dressing, if it keeps you warm in winter, it'll keep you cool in summer. And I was like, there's something to that. I've heard people say that you have to drink hot water in hot weather to stay cool. It's like, there's almost something there that sounds right, but I don't know. Right. But funny. then you're like, 
or is it just complete a complete fabrication? You know, like it's there's yeah. such a fine line you aren't sure. Yeah. Robin says page 57 talking about the hole you can't fill. Oh yes. Mary and I talked a lot about that image and how it runs through and sort of unifies the whole piece and um, how profound that is and how yeah. personal it is from that first image of his dad's Dinty's dad standing in the hole, working his job as a mechanic to the grave and all of these, you know, the emptiness, the feeling of emptiness inside us and um, all of that, that idea of um, disconnection and, and being cast out like that hole just reverberates through the whole story. Yeah. And I, I also found that passage really moving Robin. I'm looking back at it. Like, I think it's, a, it's, you know, he makes this point about like why we find celebrity suicide so unsettling mm -hmm. because they're the people who have what we think will make everyone happy or make us happy. And then, and it's like, wait, if they're not happy, oh no, you know, like mm -hmm. what am I trying to accumulate? What, why am I working so hard? Why do I, what matters? You know, like it kind of shakes every, the foundation. Mm -hmm. um, What is paradise when, thanks Amanda, favorite passage was at the end. What is paradise pages 151? Oh, I loved that one. I think you're talking about the very end. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, the very end. Yeah, yeah it's really, point. it's really elegant and beautiful. But it does have that a little bit of sadness too. There was a little wistfulness or something for me, but it, it is a really lovely passage. Sort of circles back to the beginning and then um, and then the idea that maybe there is no hole. Yeah. And that would be the most amazing thing. That you don't feel the deep emptiness. Right. And it's such a cool passage too, because the one that starts what is paradise after all, because I think for me, it reads, you know, he does, he uses the repetition of maybe, 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 maybe. And mm -hmm. kind of similar to what I was saying earlier about how a comedic technique, a humor technique can be to start with something that's true and then to diverge from there. Like he starts with this plate of warm pasta and that seemed, it seems pretty clear to me, could be wrong, obviously, but it seems like this is something that really happened to him. Like this is a moment in a restaurant in Florence and the waitress is really named Nora and she really does remind him of his childhood mm -hmm. crush. Um, and he really does, he really has bought too many postcards, you know, but then the maybes, then the maybes mm -hmm. get more fan fantasy they get more fantastical like sister mary mark so now we're in his head right because he's fantasizing like that she apologizes and um and so then it just gets more um hopeful it gets hopeful but imaginary like now he's projecting into what he hopes is reality not mm -hmm. what necessarily is for him yet mm -hmm. That's a nice part of um, writing memoir and creative nonfiction too, the idea of perhapsing, of being able to imagine, you know, we write the things that, that truly happen to us, but we're allowed to fantasize. And that tells us a lot and shares a lot about ourselves too. It's a really yeah. nice way to end. I'm just looking at Brit's the parts that resonated with Brit, um, the theology we understood for the beginning years of our life, God loves you, seemed pretty reassuring up to the point that we became capable of independent thought, but it is 2020 as I write this and we are, did he write that? But it is 2020 as I write this, that's also the quote, right? And we are a fairly sophisticated batch of human critters. So why do we still hang on to the gruesome metaphor? Yeah. It's powerful writing. I mean, he's, He's a great writer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why would the perhaps not end up being true, Glista says. Mm -hmm. 
why would the perhaps not end up being true? Mm -hmm. It could be. Yeah, I think it could be. It's just not. I it's think when he, when he says maybe Sister Mary Mark walks by, I think that's when we're like, okay, now we're kind of in the realm of imagination. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't suggesting it's not true, but it's not literal in that moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's true to his desire and his wish and his, his hope. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Brett, I liked that too, how it's a, here's what I'm wondering about without saying here's, um, without saying here's not wondering about. Mm. Says something without saying it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. Well, do you want to introduce the exercise, Nicole? Sure. So I, I thought I'd try something different today. And I, I hope maybe some of you will come along with me for it. Um, I thought it would be kind of fun to think about how we can use Dinty's book as a launching off point for our own writing. If anyone out there is interested in trying an, an argument, writing an argument. And so I was thinking we could try to just sketch out an outline. And think about think about something that you would like to write an argument about. It can be silly or outrageous or something serious. Um, we know why Dinty's argument meant so much to him. So I was again thinking about that idea of the of the rings. So using kind of a visual technique to start an outline with you in the center, and then that first ring around you. Once you've chosen your subject is why, why it matters to you specifically. So um, I have a few things I could, I've been thinking about writing an argument about, and I don't know if this will resonate with any of you, but I have some, <laughs> I have <my> neighbors. <laughs> and um, that's always interesting, the idea of boundaries and encroachment and like having different ideas about, um, for example, ours is about um, lawn maintenance. And this seems to come up for us every spring and summer where, you know, we don't seem to mow enough and our next door neighbor lets us know we don't do that by doing our lawn for us. So imagine us last um, spring in lockdown, my whole family's home, my kids are home and my 84 year old neighbor is driving his lawnmower past our front window while we're eating lunch together. <laughs> so I have, I have some funny scenes that I would like to work here. But, um, at, and I think this is like a, a clash of values type situation, maybe. Mm -hmm. And that's how I'm kind of framing my argument is there are good reasons to not mow your lawn constantly. Um, but also, you know, we're busy people. So around around my first ring, it, I am irritated by the feeling of, of encroachment. And, um, and then in the next ring, you know, how does this affect the ring, the outer ring around my family? As my wife and I have talks about this all the time. Um, when it comes up. And so I would pick some scenes related to, to that. And then maybe I would expand my argument out into society and how this idea of um, immaculate lawns is really actually bad for the environment. And it's bad for for the bees. And it's bad. There's a whole movement about please don't mow your lawn until May so that the wildflowers have a chance to come up and the bees have a chance to pollinate. So I'm getting, as I'm going to the outer ring, and I'm making my argument, I'm getting um, I'm getting more and more um, prepared for this argument with my neighbor because I have all of these ideas that are now getting into like judgments about how how we have different views around what's important and eat down to the environment now. So I just wanted to um, to put that idea out there and see what kind of subjects kind of might be ripe in your life for exploration. What, um, it could be big things like sexism that definitely have that outer radiation into larger culture and affect us personally, or it can be something, you know, a little bit more silly, like taking on a neighbor. So does anyone have any ideas they want to share or Mary, can I put you on the spot and see what you would make an argument about if you're writing a personal essay? Yeah, I'll think for a moment. Let me think for a moment. I was actually just thinking about yours because I was thinking, Another direction, I love your environmental direction for your biggest ring, but I think you, you, you could go a couple of different directions, but you could go environmental, like literal, the planet and, you know, what's good for lawns, but you could also go kind of, and I don't know what this direction would be called, but like 
the direction of like personal boundaries and how just because someone in their mind is doing you a favor doesn't warrant necessarily them coming into your space. Like mm-hmm. it would be understood that he can't come into your lawn and steal something or even come into your lawn and like sit there and hang out. Like ev- that would be like, everyone would be like, no, that of course he shouldn't do that. But for some reason him mowing your lawn justifies it in his mm-hmm. own mind, which, and it's like, why just because you think of it as doing a favor, maybe doesn't mean it's okay. Exactly. And then there's, there's these other parts of it too, is that there's like, I'm deferential to someone who's older than me. You know, I want to be nice to my older neighbor and polite. And, you know, it started out with him just doing, you know, he's doing his own lawn. And so he gets his son to do like the front part by the road. And then they're closer and closer to the house. And then it's the whole front yard and it's a favor, (laughs) but it also feels like a message. (laughs) So there's, there's some potential potential there for humor I think you know some gentle humor definitely yeah, not I think it's a hint I think it's a hint I mean the describing the mower going by the window right as you're eating sounds pretty passive <laughs> like where do you look how can you right. not notice <laughs> right um Liz says if she ever started sweeping her driveway with a broom <laughs> <Come in. laughs> that- uh. I have said similar to things to my friends, Liz, but it's about doing, if I ever start doing makeup tutorials from my closet, <laughs> which I feel like a, just a phenomenon I've seen on the internet and I never want to reach that point. Mm. Um, okay. So Allison says, what about the form of how do his rings mesh with yours? Maybe he thinks you're busy. Right. Like he has to totally do. This is why I love fiction. Cause you could totally, you could just get in this person's head and explore everything he could be thinking. Mm-hmm. I love that you've gone with another visual as a way to in to start sketching out these ideas. Um, I want to respond to it. Just my chat just bumped down out. Amanda says, I liked yours. I could write about all the chemicals my neighbor uses on the lawn and plantings. Well, this, this is where it, things started getting worse because the neighbor on the other side of the neighbor has <laughs> was um, we have water restrictions in the, in the summer. So you're not allowed to water your lawn at certain times. And they had like hydro seeded and had like the only lawn in town with a soccer pitch. Like basically everyone else has dead lawns and they have this perfect lawn and they're using all this water. And so they started pumping chemicals at the front of, our, they, they were wanting to eradicate all the dandelions and so they, we found them on our front lawn, like not on our front lawn, but the lawn that covers the road, pumping something on the dandelions. And I was home and my car was there. And like, why aren't you asking me to, if it's okay to do this? I have kids. And so I went out and I confronted her and I said, so what's going on here? Like with the chemicals? And she said, oh, this isn't chemicals. It's bleach. <gasps> no. <laughs> what, what is bleach? Bleach. Isn't oh, bleach no. chemicals? So I have lots of little humorous things to use about my neighbors and lawns. This isn't chemicals, it's bleach. Yeah. And my son was devastated. Dandelions are pretty, mommy. Why would she want to kill the yellow flowers? And yeah. then my my uh, my daughter thought that I should have taken taken a stronger, you know, confronted them. She was really offended. So then I was in the middle of my kids and my neighbors. So when you said I'm a nine, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Conflict. <laughs> um, yeah, I was trying to think of what I feel. What do I get passionate about um, that I might write an argument against? Um, okay, well, this is kind of on topic, just but that's just incidental because it's the thing that came to mind. I. I don't like the belief, the very widespread belief that good writing should take forever and be painful to do. Mm-hmm. Um, particularly the, the, the idea that it's supposed to take a long time. And if it takes a long time, then you're a good writer. And if it comes mm-hmm. fast, you're a bad writer <laughs> or a lazy writer, a cheap writer. Um, and so I guess my rings, the first would be for me personally, I'm very invested in that argument because I, you know, I want to write at the speed at which the writing comes to me. And sometimes my best writing, my best writing often comes very, very quickly. And some of my worst writing is just trickles out. So I, I see personally no association between how difficult or how laborious or how long um, a project takes. 
and how good it is. Um, and then I guess the next level would be um, other writers, like how I see it affecting other writers, this belief for better mm -hmm. or worse, and letting go of that belief, I think liberates them. And I do see that. And then the, the level beyond that might be, I think when we have more good stories in the world, that's a positive. That's like a net positive for everybody, for readers, for like those of us who consume stories. Like we need more stories. We need more different kinds of stories. We need more diverse stories. And that's more likely to happen if more writers feel liberated. Mm -hmm. I like this ring. I like this rings thing. Yeah, it's kind of a fun way to just, you know, of course the, the personal is the most obvious thing we want to write about, the thing that irks us or irritates us. But if you can sort of expand it, I think it makes the story really interesting and multi-layered and... Um, is non-dual living possible both end? Well, see, this is the thing. And, and Dinty does this too. He makes his argument, but then he says, and there's the rub. Let's complicate it a little bit. There is evil in the world and we don't really have an explanation for this. And so if it's not original sin, what is it? And for me, the rub is gardening is a really healthy activity. I'm glad my neighbors are making their lawn beautiful and their house beautiful for us. And it makes the, the property values higher. If we all left our lawns, mm -hmm. it wouldn't be a nice place to live. So I can see that too. And I think complicating it also makes for interesting stories. Yeah. So that was, thank you for, for saying that because it reminded me to, um, to, to know that there's more than, of course, I can see it from other sides too. Can I ask Nicole how, because this is a really unusual memoir, you know, like the way that, I mean, I think it's, it was marketed as memoir, but some people have even said like, but it's more of an argument. Like if people mm -hmm. are writing more traditional memoir, whether it's a, whether it's a book or whether it's a personal essay, um, can you see a way they could use the, this rings thing still, even if what they're making isn't, as explicitly an argument as Dinty is? Mm -hmm. I think so. I think that's an element that we can talk about in craft where we, we look at um, stories in, within a context, within a larger world context and, and impacts. And I think it always makes stories more interesting when they're placed in a larger world. And that world mm -hmm. is engaging with our smaller life that we're, we're writing about on the page and exploring on the page. Yeah, I love that. I really love that. And that could be a good challenge if you're writing any kind of personal narrative, like what to think about those rings. Like I'm writing it from my perspective, but maybe there's a way to zoom out and see how mm. it's actually to affect and to, and to explore that in the writing, how it's affecting people on these bigger levels. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. For sure. Yeah. Tackling big ones like, like sexism and racism. There's, I mean, it's, it would just be so ripe for that idea of the, the personal impacts and the people you care about. And then of course, there's like a whole larger generational um, impact for those kinds of stories. And they may not be the kinds of stories that you're writing humor about, but you can still use that, that technique or that, that visual to start finding scenes, to start finding examples and to create an argument or, or build a story, I think. Cool. I like that. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Should we share the next book, the book for next month? I think we should. Um, okay. Everyone be patient with me. I'm going to have to go get it off my shelf. I want to show okay. you the cup. Yay. Um, Marion says, I was a first reader for a CNF contest last year, and I saw lots of lovely memoirs of intense human experience, but not much reflection on the meaning beyond their own experience. So Marion, how did that affect your reading of those pieces? Did, do you think that was um, an element that was really missing for you to, or, or were writers able to pull it off, pull off a really powerful story, even if there wasn't reflection on the meaning beyond their own experience. I'd be curious to hear what you think about that. Oh, Krista, I'm glad you like this rings idea. Yay. I was hoping someone might pick it up and, and run with it. 
Mm. Um, you wanted to go them them to go out a ring or two. Interesting. Okay, that's great. It's actually yeah, something. Brit, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, Britt, I I totally appreciate that. I've dropped an idea out there that I definitely felt like maybe we could start sketching this out together in the time we had, or maybe it would be something people would have to take away and really think about. But I just wanted to introduce the idea. I'm glad that you that you like the prompt. Thank you. And I, it's something that I have heard um, on, Mary. chatting um, my my literary agent and I were talking about the kind of the the publishing industry right now and what kind of memoir publishers are looking for. Um, and I know, at least according to her, what she was telling me is like this big the big ring is really important. Mm. Like, your personal experience in a social, in a social context and being able to kind of place yourself in a bigger mm -hmm. matrix and examine how those, what, how you wound up here rather than it just being so focused on like, this is my personal experience, mm -hmm. um, is something that's, that, that publishers look for right now. So mm -hmm. that's good to know. Okay. Next month, um, we are reading a book called Saint X by Alexis Shaitkin. Shaitkin. I should figure mm -hmm. out how to pronounce her last name. Um, but Saint X is, uh, it's really good. It's really good, everybody. You are going to love it. Um, it is, uh, I don't know if it's technically a thriller, but it reads like a thriller. It does involve um, the disappearance of um, and death of a teenage girl and much of the story is um the search for to, to try to find the truth of what happened to this girl but um it is really it's told in such an interesting way the the point of view is really original um the shifts in point of view are really original there's just a lot that she does in this book that i think is is quite bold and that i haven't seen before and I'm I was I finished reading it really impressed with her craft and with the choices that she made and so there's going to be a lot to talk about um plus it's just so good you don't want to put it down it's like what it's one of these books that I you know I'll be curious to hear what other people think but like uh, as I was reading it I, I thought I wish I had written this book um, so oh. same text. we'll email you the title. You don't have to, in case you forget, you don't have to write it down. Um, yeah. Oh, Liz, Liz says, I love this ring idea. I wonder if it could be tweaked a bit for fiction. That's a cool, that's a cool. I thought. think so. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It could. Yeah. I love that. I have to think, I want to think about that too. Think about, I'm curious, Mary, for your own writing, have you done that just intuitively, you know, in your own writing for fiction? I don't write fiction, so I'm curious. It's interesting because I think the way that I teach is to kind of go the opposite. Like we start with the big circle and then go in because we start with what is the big human question that's at the heart of your book. And it's like something that's really thorny and existential and has ethical implications. And so I think in that way, we kind of start big and then figure out the small. Um, mm -hmm. But it's cool to think of starting with the small and figure, and then like figuring out the big. Um, and maybe in a way that's what we're also doing because sometimes people will come with, maybe we just do that before we start because sometimes people will come with ideas for like a plot, for like just a general plot idea or a character idea. And then we probe at it till we figure out what is like the big question that they're really trying to get at. Mm. Um, I think with this book um, that we looked at today, didn't he may have started with that bigger, bigger world, bigger question? At least that's how the argument starts. Mm. But then we learn much later where the heart is that was always there. So you can, I think you can think about it in both ways, like coming down to a smaller point and a character and right. or starting with the, the character at the center. And yeah, zooming in or zooming out. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. Well, as we wrap up, Nicole, um, mm -hmm. what classes are you offering right now? If people want to work on memoir with you? 
Yeah, I have a course coming up. It's going to be taught by a, a guest instructor, but I've designed the course. It's called Spark Your Visual Story. It starts on May 3rd, and it's a six-week deep dive into visual storytelling forms. So we work with images and um, how image and text can work together, how um, visual art can influence uh, story structure. It's really fun, experimental, exciting um, and I think there's still a few spots available that we limit the number of students to 10 to keep it small for discussions. But if anyone's interested, they can go to my website at nicolebright.com or I can add a link to to the a next email, a follow up email from our talk today with our replay. Great. Cool. Well, thank you all for coming. So good to see you. Thanks for coming and chatting with us. We love we love chatting with you. So we appreciate yeah, that thanks. you make Live. Thank you so much for joining us. It was uh, we had such great discussion in the chat today. Thanks everyone for coming and participating. And we'll see you next month. Bye. Bye.